Well, Ricky, um, we, we haven't seen you for a while. And, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Uh, you weren't there that day. I, actually, I, I wasn't there, but I got a, got a uh, text or a phone call. I can't remember. It's just kind of vague, but uh, yeah. I was there pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Now, your name had obviously been on the ballot. Um, so what was your reaction? Who called? Was it Winston? I guess? Uh, no, I got a text from uh, – I'm going I'm to let him stay anonymous right now because I don't know if he went outside the envelope. To oh. contact or not. <laughs> I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but I got a text literally at uh, – I think it was at 440, uh, 420, uh, 420. Yeah. And the announcements could be made at 5 o'clock. And basically the text – it didn't say that I was in the Hall of Fame. It said – it's in your best interest, I think, if you come on down to the Hall of Fame. And it wasn't real hard to figure that one out. I knew it was vote day. Yeah. So I said, man, this this is wild. I can't believe this. So, I, But I still left the house not 100% sure if I was in the Hall of Fame or not. So when they read your name, what was that moment like? Yeah, it was kind of like almost disbelief because I've been – I think what made it kind of – I wouldn't say difficult. It, the years were getting more difficult because I was on the on the ballot for I think this was the eighth year, so uh, I was going through this process, which is a good thing to have to worry about if you're going to make make it or not or get that call, and um, and it the days would come and go and it'd be a huge letdown. So I got in so the last couple of years I didn't get too excited about it. I knew when vote day was, and I knew I needed to be in the Charlotte area yeah. uh, on vote day just in case. Because we, we spent some time in Florida, too. So we want to make sure we we're in this area at that time. And so when I when I got the message to get down there, it was like kind of disbelief. Couldn't hardly really believe it. It finally may become true, but I wasn't sure until I got there. You and I talked back in, I don't know, 2009, 10, somewhere in there. And at that point, I mentioned the NASCAR Hall of Fame. And you didn't you didn't necessarily blow it off. But you said, you know, there's there's a lot of people that need to go in, and then maybe we can consider my case and all that kind of thing. What what did it mean to you personally to to finally get that word, hear your name announced? Yeah. But what did it mean to you personally that you finally got that acknowledgement? I think the biggest thing is it's kind of like. Uh, you know, you're always shooting to win a race or win championships. And, you know, probably my biggest race win was Indianapolis. And, you know, that was, that was really big, and it really still stands out in my mind. But for some reason, you know, I never gave up on a championship. I always went after it. It just never, you know, I think we came close one year, finished second. Yeah. But I don't think that meant as much to me. If I'd have won a championship, I think the Hall of Fame to me, I think what it says is that, the people that we race with, our peers, the guys we competed against day to day, you know, th- a lot of those guys have the say so in the vote. So I think it's to know that you are recognized to be, you know, one of the elite status guys um, to race during that era. And uh, it probably personally meant more to me than, than any championship could have ever meant. I always thought that one of the things that, that necessarily, I, I don't want to say necessarily hurt your case, but there are, what three or four guys who have really similar similar careers? You mm-hmm. and Harry Gant and Neil Bonnet, uh, Jeff Bodine, I guess. Mm-hmm. I think you all have a similar number mm-hmm. of wins, uh, and it, it would be hard to make a case. What do you think finally puts you over the top? I have an opinion, yeah. but I, I want to hear what you have to say first. Well, I'm not. I think a lot of it had to do with the fans too. The fans were. Uh, real instrumental. I know there's a write-in portion of the ballot, but I think the I understand, uh, I don't do a whole lot of online stuff, but I understand that the fans really went to bat, and we're starting to get pretty angry that, you know, if you lay records out and you look at the win column and you look at top fives, top tens, and things of that nature, uh, we were starting to actually have credentials that maybe could have got us in a year or two earlier, two or three years maybe, and it you know, and we didn't get there. And I think coming close a couple of years ago on the vote, missed it by maybe one vote of getting in. I think the fans really, you know, got behind and helped push this thing through, I think. But I think, you know, as time goes on and, you know, articles get written, and uh, I think that probably set my career apart differently was was the timing when I came into the sport. I came in in the mid-'70s, and I was just turned 18, just graduated from high school, 
And, uh, and the first race car that I actually sat in was a cup car at, uh, at Rockingham, North Carolina. Prior to that, go-karts, dirt bikes, you know, kind of more like regional neighborhood type stuff. And then all of a sudden trying to go to a race and, and that being Rockingham, North Carolina and hopping in a car, there was no testing. There was no, uh, <laughs> there was nothing to really compare it to. Except, you know, probably one of the scariest things I think I ever did is I hopped in with that race car. I was usually pretty uh, pretty cocky kid. You know, I was confident in what I was doing. But I got in that race car, and I said, wow, this is – I've never done anything like this. It's, it's going to take a lot of learning here. It's going to take a lot of learning to get this uh, – get this figured out but i think it i think because it was so difficult it kept me challenged but it took a it took quite a while you know uh, i mean even if i had sat in richard petty's winning race cars of that era there's no way i could have won a race i mean i just i didn't i didn't have the credentials i didn't know what i was doing and i had to learn and had to learn without wrecking and without killing myself and killing somebody else yeah um you had to learn on the job and it took a long time to to, to get a feel for that well steve what do you think put ricky over the top you said that you had an opinion yeah it's kind of a it might not be a big thing but it is to me sometimes when you have drivers who win races and championships what boils it down into putting them in the hall of fame is a singular achievement something a little bit different and in ricky's case for a long time he held the record for a number of consecutive years with at least one victory. And that was noted by a lot of people in those days, even Sports Illustrated, of all things. They had a section back then called By the Numbers, and I was reading it on an airplane, and uh, it had a big number 14 up there. And it said, 14, number of years NASCAR driver Ricky Rudd has won at least one race per season. I thought, well, they, if they know that, you know, certainly that's got to be attached to Ricky as a very singular achievement. And on down the road, even though Rusty, you know, passed him, fair enough, and Rusty got in the Hall of Fame ahead of him, by the way, I think that that's stuck in some voters' minds, particularly, you know, guys like me who said, he did this, and, and when you stop and think about it, that is really something unique. See, that sports is an illustrated issue. Uh, I got off the plane. I don't know why Ricky was in the same airport, but there it was. It's Charlotte. I said, Ricky, <laughs> come here, look at this. I want to show you this. And I showed him that it's sports illustrated. Ricky read it. And his eyes got wide, and he said, can I have this? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Guys. Come on, Wade. <laughs> Not with me. <laughs> well, here's here's my opinion. I, I think that the consistency and, and the win streak was, was certainly in your favor, but also Richmond, 84, oh, and yeah. uh, Martinsville, 94. 98, 99? Yeah, I think it's 98. 98. Um, whenever a hardcore old school race fan talks about how, you know, racers used to be real men and all that kind of thing, without fail, they say, Ricky Rudd won a race at Richmond with his eyes taped open. <laughs> they, they say, they talk about, they talk about Martinsville and he, he was passed out in the car. He was, he was comatose and he still won the race. <laughs> yeah. But I, I really do think that those two things really kind of put you over the top. You know, that, that comes up quite a bit, you know, the, you know, what it takes to be a driver. But, you know, I looked at it in those days. I wasn't trying to be a Superman. I was, well, actually two things. I was trying to make sure that I didn't get fired from being, you know, too sick on the job and <laughs> lay out two or three weeks because they'll forget about you pretty quick. Uh, but once you get through that, I mean, I look back at, you know, people like, and I'm going to leave out some of these names, but you got Kale Yarborough. You know, when I think toughness, I think of Kale. Uh, seen him, hands bleeding, get out of a race car, hands bleeding, you know, no gloves. And, uh, and, you know, Bobby Allison, Petty, and Yarbrough, I mean, all these guys, uh, and I'm leaving out some of the names. But those are the guys when I was, you know, coming through the ranks, and uh, those are the guys that were winning races. And I said, man, I want to be, be like these guys. But I really think that generation of drivers 
if they were dealt the same cards that I'd have been dealt, they'd have done the same thing I did. I mean, I didn't look at it as being, you know, trying to be Superman. I just looked at it as, hey, this this is part of driving. You got to get your act together. You got to be tough on the track, and and you can't let you know sort of little things you know keep you out. And uh, so I think uh, I think having those guys to, you know, before me you know, to look up to. That's what I think. That's what. Uh, you know, I wanted to be like those guys, and uh, so I d- did everything I could to try to be like them. Uh, and, and on the track, the toughness, uh, you know, I worked out in the gym, which uh, early days, there wasn't a whole lot of guys in the gym. And I'm one of the survivors that can say that I, I boxed with Humpy Wheeler and, uh, <laughs> and can live to tell about it. Uh, so, you know, that was my routine. We'd go in there, and we'd box a 30-minute round. Um, and, and, of course, it was big, heavy gloves. It was more of an aerobic deal than it was anything. But it stung enough you didn't want to get hit in the head, and you'd cover up. But uh, <laughs> and Humpy was just playing with us. He could have he knocked me out at any time. But, but the training and stuff, that helped a lot, too. 